Um, Jeff, the $2 million price tag is based on the idea that it's one and done for the rest of your life, and that's going to save the healthcare system money. What if it doesn't last for the rest of your life? Is Vertex open to giving people rebates? Yeah, great, great <laughs> question. Um, so let, let's just talk a little bit about what the data has taught us so far in terms of the longevity. We have patients, as you know, out more than four years now with uh, a long-term effect that's very, very stable. Um, so I, th I think that's sort of number one. The other thing that's obviously remarkable about these, this new generation of therapies is that it is a one and done. In other words, I think we treated 100 patients or so, Sam, in the, in the phase three trial. And of those, 97% of the sickle cell patients were completely free of symptoms, and 92% of the, the um, uh, beta thal patients were free from transfusion. So it is truly a life-altering, essentially curative kind of therapy. So with respect to price, you know, obviously it's always a, a difficult one to set the price on these. And this one was a little easier for two reasons. One, this is a very expensive therapy to manufacture, very complicated since you have to take the patient's cells out, edit them, put them back in, uh, and there's a hospital procedure. But the other one was there's a very strong health economic argument for this particular disease. If there's well-documented evidence that for the average sickle cell patient, the lifelong uh, cost of treatment is somewhere between four and six and a half million dollars. And so if you actually do have a therapy that, that can take care of that, obviously at two million dollars, that's a tremendous savings to the healthcare system. And so far we're seeing payers being very, very receptive to that, uh, both at the government side and on the private paying side. I think there's an acceptance that this is, it's a good deal as well as a good therapy. They're not asking to like, you know, give payments and, you know, not, you know, not up front sort of to break it up. No, in fact, the opposite. So we, we went out and had some discussions beforehand, Sam will remember this, about different payment models because we, we weren't sure what they were going to prefer. And universally, they preferred the upfront payment model as long as we were seeing these long-term effects. Mm -hmm. And Sam, I mean, how can, these, um, how can these therapies help people with ultra, ultra rare diseases if $2 million is you know, kind of like the starting point if you have even fewer patients the price is probably going to be even higher. So will CRISPR be available for patients that have ultra-rare diseases? Yeah. Um, first of all, I just want to say that, you know, having this drug Castevi approved just 10 years after the elucidation of the platform uh, is just remarkable. I think people talk about singularity and how, you know, machines become smarter than humans. But, you know, the fact that we as humans can edit our own genome to make ourselves better is a very important moment in the history of mankind. Um, and, you know, while we're celebrating that approval, I think it's, you know, I just concur with everything Jeff said, which is, you know, I think Vertex has been so responsible in thinking about the price. And it's not based on, well, here are the number of patients and here's how much money we need to make. It's based on what value we're adding to the system. And even the pharmacoeconomic lens in the case of sickle cell tells you that this price that we've, that we've used is actually gonna create a lot of value for the system. Hence, there's no pushback from payers, uh, and they welcome this responsible approach. So that doesn't mean that you know, if there's solutions for ultra, ultra therapies, we say, oh wait, one-tenth the number of patients, so the cost should be 20, 10 times more. That is not at all how we're looking at it. Uh, in fact, we are going after both common diseases and rare diseases. And in each case, we're gonna apply that same lens, which is what is the benefit that we're bringing to patients what is the value to the system? And my prediction long term is that as we get to this new paradigm of medicine of one and done and durable treatments, you actually will save the system money and make it more sustainable to bring medicines to more patients in need. And Amy, the other thing is the technology is advancing, as you said. I mean, we aren't sitting on our laurels. Sam and I are working hard together to make this faster, better, and less expensive to produce. And as we do that, we can both increase access and hopefully reduce price. How long will it take to get a cheaper CRISPR? It won't be a single thing, but you know, one of the things that Sam and I are working hard on together is today you have to have a fairly significant uh, bone marrow ablation protocol before you get the cells back, and then you need to be in the hospital for a while. So that's one of the reasons it takes so long and so expensive. If we could make a gentler conditioning regimen so that this could be done essentially as an outpatient or done with a couple of days in the hospital, it would be a game changer, both in terms of the number of patients that would have access to the drug, but potentially also the price. And we're, I think we're making good progress. We're not there, but we're, we're not gonna stop till we get there. Yes, yeah, Sam, you talked about the potential for doing the gene editing inside the body, even for a, a, a later version of, of Kastrevi. Like where, 
like where are you with inside the body gene editing, not having to do it outside, which increases the cost? Well, that's something, you know, uh, Jeff, you'll recall, we talked about this years ago, which is yeah. when you think about, you know, Africa and how we get to patients in Africa, uh, eventually we're gonna have to have something that's potentially in vivo because, you know, the hospital systems, the infrastructure to do something that's an ex vivo cell therapy, it's just not there. Like if you go to Botswana or Kenya, there's maybe one center that can, that can do it, but not, again, they're not qualified. So what is the next wave is in vivo uh, editing? which is not that easy. It's complex biology, we're working on it. We have a grant from the Gates Foundation, you know, Vertex is also working on it in parallel. Um, it's sort of like electric vehicles, you know, when the Tesla came out, the models were more expensive and everyone asked the question, how is this gonna get less expensive? Uh, and even before that was Fisker Karma. <laughs> but now you see EV vehicles that are much lower cost because technology enables uh, lower costs with scale and improvement in, in sort of the supply infrastructure and everything else. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 my prediction is, I think it's hard to say when is there gonna be a less expensive CRISPR because that's a very hard question. You know, in the case of oncology or allogeneic CAR T's, it may come sooner than you anticipate, but for some rare diseases it may take a little longer because there's complex biology to deal with. But the refreshing thing here is the companies that are the vanguard of this new wave, like Vertex, us, or maybe Regeneron, you know, we're not shackled with the old pharma mindset around pricing and how you think about profits. And so we're able to think independently and say what makes sense in the context of the disease and the system. I, I, I know that there are a lot of disparities with countries outside the United States, but even inside the United States, many of the 16,000 sickle cell patients in this country are on Medicaid. So what's gonna happen? I mean, there's a proposal for um, Medicaid you know, reimbursing, but they wanna do it based on outcomes, not, you know, not upfront. Where does Vertex, for instance, stand on that kind of proposal? Yeah, we've been working on this obviously for a long time, even before the, uh, before the approval. And I think we've made great progress. If you, if you think about the numbers in the US, about 100,000 sickle cell patients, we think about 25,000 or so are, of those are severe enough to be amenable to this therapy, so we'll start with 25,000. A lot of them are on Medicaid. Today, we have 60% of those patients on Medicaid covered already, and 25% more that we think were just weeks to months away. So within a very short period of time, we'll have 90% of those patients covered on Medicaid. And again, what we're seeing as we go, you have to go state by state, obviously, what we're seeing as we go to each state is, it's a very simple education process. When you show them the benefit and you show them the cost savings to the system, we're, we're just not getting a lot of pushback. And, and what about uptake? What are some of the concerns that patient groups have, have raised about uptake? There have been concerns raised by the patient advocacy group. I, I think the biggest concern we're hearing, Amy, is the procedure is so complex that people have to take a few weeks or months off of work. Mm -hmm. They often have to travel because only specialized centers can do this. And then a third feature that's very important to patients and to us is preservation of fertility. And so we, again, have been working on that very hard for these patients. We have permission from um, HHS to, to help patients with their travel expenses, their lodging expenses. We can get them to the centers. So I think we've more or less solved that problem. We're still discussing the fertility problem because there's a very complex set of regulations around that. But I think we're making progress. And if, if you ask me, I think we'll solve that problem in the next three to six months and be able to help patients with their fertility preservation. I was thinking about that because you know, in cancer care, for example, chemotherapy regimens can also damage your fertility, yes. but drug makers aren't covering egg banking for cancer patients. Why, does, why did Vertex get involved with that kind of program? Well, sort of like Sam said, I think Vertex and CRISPR have a common culture, which is quite different from what you might call drug maker culture. You know, when we got into this, I remember Sam and I were, were told by lots of folks on Wall Street and elsewhere, like, well, why are you doing this? It's a disease where you can't really make any money and it's a difficult population to treat, et cetera, et cetera. And, and our answer was, because we now have the technology to actually cure this disease that hasn't been treated well for 60 years, and we're gonna do that. Um, and it's the same for these sorts of things. I mean, Vertex has a long history of making sure that every patient has access to our medicines, regardless of their zip code or their ability to pay, and also that we can help them out with some of the other costs, which are sort of the hidden costs of getting these therapies. And that's a cultural similarity, I think, between us and CRISPR. But you are gonna make money. We hope we'll make money eventually. We sort of <laughs> I have mean, to do that. That is, the, yeah. you are a yeah. business, right? Yeah. That your culture is making money. If I may add something, Amy, on the question on the fertility, which is, you know, I don't know how many in the audience here have actually met with some of the patients that have sickle cell. And 
time is of the essence. You know, I think early days we were working with a patient advocacy group, and there was one person who was a patient advocate who was 32 years old, you know, pretty fit, would go to the gym all the time, and one day just died, you know, because they had a stroke. And that's the thing about sickle cell is there's like this sword hanging on your head, and not to mention the chronic pain and everything else. So, yes, there are a lot of challenges, you know, in terms of hospitals having to increase capacity, which, by the way, is not a big challenge. I think people write about it. We have to solve the fertility equation, but, you know, many cases, I think patients will say, look, I cannot live with this disease anymore. I need a drug, I need a therapy tomorrow. I cannot wait. And that's why we did, we acted with such urgency in the clinical trials through COVID, you know, in the pandemic time frame, it was very hard to have patients in the hospital because the hospitals were overrun. Even in that time frame, we made sure we were pedal to the metal in getting patients this therapy so that they have an option when this disease is, you know, in many cases could be deadly for them. So I, I think that just to put all this in context, right, there's, you know, since this is the first approved therapy in sickle cell, everybody's writing about an angle. There's an article about fertility or an angle about hospital capacity. Mm -hmm. But the reality is there's a great unmet need for the first disease that was discovered as a molecular disease in Chicago, where, yep. where you were uh, practicing. Um, and uh, we had no solution for 70 years, you know, and th that's the bigger picture, I think, that will allow this to, you know, be have a greater uptake than, than most people imagine. You know, one of the strange oh, things that happens in this, these diseases, and we saw it in CF too, is when you really get to know the patients. And in these diseases, you get to know the patients when you're developing yeah. these therapies. And one of the things you realize is this complete shift in their outlook on life. So RCF patients before therapy, they weren't thinking about having children, they weren't thinking about working, and they were not thinking about living to be 60 or 70 years old until we had a therapy that essentially cured them. And suddenly, now they want to get pregnant, they want to go back to work, they want to have a normal life. And we're starting to see the same kinds of things here, that patients who had no hope about really a future life are beginning to think about that, and that, that's a remarkable thing. How many years out do you think a patient needs to be without an episode to say I'm cured? I don't know, that's a, that's a tough question. I, I tell you my belief, it's a belief, and we need to demonstrate this, but everything we know about the technology says once you do an edit like this, it's there for life, because it's in the DNA, and that DNA is there in those cells for life, and these cell clones seem to be quite, quite stable. So everything we're seeing so far says that's true in lots of patients, not in 20% of the patients or 30%, but the proof is in the pudding, and I, I think when we start to get out seven or 10 years, each year our confidence will go up. Yeah. And the other thing I'll add, which is, you know, this question comes up a lot because in many cases, those who are not deep in the technology, it's like once bitten, twice shy. In gene therapies, traditional gene therapies, which use AAVs, they're not integrating into the genome. They're sitting there in the nucleus, but they don't replicate, right? So when cells replicate, you dilute the number of, you know, vehicles carrying the gene that you want to put in the, in the patient. And so you do have a major durability question. So in the case of some of the gene therapies, three, four years out, you start losing durability. So the question people ask is, is that same thing gonna happen in gene editing? Mm -hmm. And the answer is no, because here you're actually editing the genome, which replicates as cells replicate, and so it's a permanent thing. And in fact, I would say, uh, again, you know, maybe uh, as a small biotech, we make these arguments. We were saying that if you see durability for six months, that should signal durability for life. Now, obviously, with the regulators, we had to settle on a much longer time frame of observation, but the, the fundamentals indicate that durability can be seen very quickly. How young do you want to go for getting gene edited? I mean, you said that the advantage is to try to edit before you've had so much damage. Yeah. So do you want to be a kindergartner yeah. and get gene edited? Great, great question, and we've faced this question in CF for, for many, many years, and obviously the responsible way to do this and the way that we've done it is you start with the older patients, and today, as you know, we're approved for patients 12 and older, but there is no doubt in my mind that we want to go younger. In CF, we're treating patients who are six months old now with our medicines, and so far, they're not getting the disease, and that's the goal here, right? Because the damage that you have before you're edited doesn't necessarily go away. So the goal is do the editing as early as possible so you don't have the heart attacks and the strokes and the kidney damage, and then you don't have the symptoms of the, the long-term sequelae of the disease. So was there animal data in like 
you know, animals that are comparable to the age of a young child, the way there was with adults, that's why you felt confident to go forward and get such young children? Yeah, so today, as you know, we're treating five to 11 year olds in our clinical trials. Mm -hmm. And that trial, I think Sam is now fully enrolled. So mm -hmm. we will see those data soon. And my prediction is actually those kids will do even better because they're younger and they're more resilient and they're better with the treatment. And then they won't develop the sequelae of the disease. I know you're not doing gene edi editing of embryos, but should we? I mean, then you wouldn't need to take any medicine. Oh, I'm happy to start, which is <laughs> my answer until about three, four months ago was absolutely not. You know, the technology is not there. We're just not ready to take on something like this where you need to edit an embryo. And why do you need to do that? Because there's, you know, if you're doing IVF, you can select embryos that are normal. You don't have to do it. And, you know, I get invited to all these ethical debates about whether we should do it or not. And then you know, you hear some of these family stories. You know, there's a story of a family that has, you know, they, they have this carrier gene, um, Fragile X, which is, a, which is a problem. You don't want to have a child with that. And the, the problem is they couldn't produce any more embryos. And they're faced with this choice of saying, do I take a risk of editing an embryo or do I do adoption or something else? And the question is, what's fair? You know, it's not, to me, it's not such an easy answer on these topics. My stance right now, as CRISPR stance, is we're not going to touch embryo embryonic gene editing because there are a lot of complications that we don't understand yet. Mm -hmm. You know, it's what, how do we get all these features developed from one cell and one embryo? Because there's spatial issues of, of chromosomes inside the cells. And there's so much more to understand. So I just don't think we're ready for it. It was our stance at, when the WHO had, a, had convened a meeting. but. You know, from a ethical standpoint, is it a no forever? I don't know, because there is still a need for many people like this story I told you where there's no other option. Is that something Vertex would ever consider? Or I, I never say never, but we're not considering it today. Yeah. And one of the reasons is we're fortunate in the diseases we're going after, like sickle cell and beta cell, that we don't, don't need to do it. We will be able to treat very early, and I think we will be able to prevent this without editing embryos. And to Sam's point, I just think we need to understand a lot more about the dynamics of what happens when you edit embryos. How much uptake do you, um, do you want to see with this drug before you declare it a success for, for, from the company's perspective? So I, I hate to say this, I don't want to mean to sound arrogant, but I already declared it a success because we've already cured whatever, you know, a hundred and some patients, and that's remarkable. If you talk to those patients, you would feel like it's a success. So I have already declared it a success, but we want to make it available to as many of those hundred thousand patients as possible. And the first step will be this therapy, but that's why we're so, we have such urgency around getting these gentler conditioning regimens and in vivo, because then all the patients will be able to take it. That's, that's always been our goal in every disease we treat. One of the themes throughout the day has been that we have all these new ideas and new therapies, but a very, very old system. So He's not so old. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say, you know, old heads of companies. <laughs> but, um, you know, Sam, you've talked about this, but I'd love to hear a little bit more. What, what changes does the system need to make to really fulfill kind of a CRISPR revolution? Yeah, uh, you know, I would say that I've actually been surprised by how malleable the system already is. You know, when we started out on this effort, uh, we took our lumps in the early days, you know, <laughs> with the regulators, we had some early meeting with payers, and it didn't seem easy at all. And to me, I was like, well, the, you know, we need, it takes a village to make this happen. We need the whole system to adapt to all this. But what we found that in the last, as people saw data and saw the power of the technology, we found that the regulators are leaning in a little bit to, to enable these therapies. Uh, in fact, at the JP Morgan conference, Peter Mark made comments about how compared to gene therapies, CRISPR is that much more predictable and they think it's safer for patients. So we found them leaning in, you know, the current administration leaning in with this initiative. Uh, so I actually, you know, probably changed my stance about yeah. how the system was not equipped at all for a therapy like this. And a lot of it's kudos to Vertex and the work they've done in educating the, the ecosystem, I would say, around how to think about a therapy that's different from the way we've thought about pills in the past. It's, it's about two things. It's education and early education, right? We started this four or five years ago, long before we had approval. And then it's just the quality of the data. This is these sorts of transformational therapies can move the system. And they have moved the system, not only in this disease, but in multiple diseases. 
Is it going to be possible to get access to this drug, though, in countries that have fewer resources, have fewer hospitals that are able to put a patient, you know, in the hospital for, for a long time while they're getting all these regimens? You know, what, what do you see this in terms of uptake outside of the United States? I, mean, I think Sam said it really, really well. Our goal is to get access to everybody. This technology today, it's going to be very difficult, both because of the cost of producing it, but even more so the lack of infrastructure in many of these countries. And you can't do a bone marrow transplant if you don't have a center that's done a lot of bone marrow transplants. That wouldn't be ethical. So right now, those are the two big, big stumbling blocks. But the hope is, as we get the technology better, as we go to gentler conditioning and then we go to in vivo therapy, that's going to open up the rest of the world. That, that's the way to get there. So really, we have to figure out the in the in, inside the body editing. That's, do you think that's the biggest change? Um, that, that's one approach. You know, there are many approaches we're all taking. There's, you know, targeted conditioning, I think, could be a major driver of that. You know, if you can get that working, which may take a shorter amount of time, uh, versus in vivo gene editing, which has many more complexities around um, biology, but also off tissue editing, et cetera. So, but, but one thing I want to frame is, you know, when I, someone asked me the other day, it's like, oh, how long may it take for in vivo gene editing for sickle cell? And I say, you know, it could be eight to 10 years. And I said, oh my God, that's a very long time. Let me remind you, this disease we've known about on the molecular basis of it for 70 years, and pharma has done zilch in 70 years. And now we have a therapy that's approved, and now we're moving at breakneck speed to make this all happen to the next gen with targeted conditioning and then in vivo within a decade. I, I think that's pretty fast when you think about how the complex treating these patients are. So I mean, when we, we started this thing, five, yeah. I think I told you this, when we started, and say I don't remember, you know, seven years ago, there was just tremendous skepticism and sort of, honestly, just people saying, don't do it. I mean, Wall Street said, don't do it. Um, regulators said, don't do it. It's going to be too hard. It's going to take too long. People inside the company, I, the founder of Vertex was vehemently opposed to us doing this, just said it's going to take 20 years, 30 years. Why, why are you doing this? It's too hard. And yet, you know, you see what happens. So I think one of the lessons here is when you see the technology and you know that it has the power and the potential to work, it's worth jumping on it, even through all that opposition, because that opposition fades away as the results start to come. But the 70 years that you, you, that you were talking about that it took so long, you know, to sort of get something wasn't only because of science. It also was because of disparities. And sometimes drug companies don't focus on certain groups that have fewer resources or are underrepresented to sort of, you know, advocate for themselves. Do you see that changing? I mean, <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, that, we're, we're trying to change that. I mean, that's, that's the big, you know, interestingly, the early days of the deal with, with Vertex, you know, you had independently decided that sickle cell and thalassemia were indications you wanted to work on through your internal process for us it made the most sense from a technology, you know, we already had technology risk, so we didn't want to take a lot of biology risk. We we're like, let's find a disease where we know what the genetic change we need to make is, or we know what the cause of the disease is from a molecular basis. So there are two different reasons why we arrived at the same indications, but, you know, there was this overhang of, of uh, disparity, not just in the health system, but among investors. This investor skepticism often drives which way people go. And in Luckily for us, we said, you know, it doesn't matter. We'll show that the technology works. And we had the good fortune of being having the CRISPR halo so we could raise money. But a lot of biotechs that would say, okay, if you have a small molecule or antibody that's not as sexy and you want to raise money to treat sickle cell disease, you were not going to be able to raise money. Um, and Vertex had obviously the, you know, the advantage of saying, you know, you, you have a drug approved and you, you don't have to think about the shackles that we put on you. So it's not just the system. Investors also have a, a driving force in some of this. But I think the fact that we've gotten to this point has changed the mindsets for many other companies. I see a lot more companies taking risks now with diseases that were not in the frame of what investors were thinking about that previously wouldn't have happened. Can you give an example that you think is you know, representative of this change? Think about some of these ultra rare diseases. You know, there's like GST1A or SCID, you know, some of these diseases where, you know, people will do the math and say there's not enough patients or, you know, this is going to cost a lot of money to do. But now companies are saying, what if we buck the regulatory framework? Not buck the regulatory framework. What if we help with the regulators change the way we think about a platform way of getting things approved, where it's, you know, you get approved for one type of SCID, it could be approved for other types of SCID, you know. So, so novel ways of thinking about drug approval, how you spend against that drug approval, and that'll change how people think about the return equation. 
right? And, and I think people are starting to do that now, whereas before you just had a dogmatic view and saying, you know what, I'm going to develop something for cancer because, you know, with cancer you're going to get paid anyways. You know, uh, our pharma is going to buy you. And that, that is a refreshing thing that we're seeing across the ecosystem. But you both are also working on common, CRISPR for common diseases as well. Is that more complicated when there's, you know, multiple factors that go into driving conditions? You know, heart disease well, or other kinds of... Your, your heart disease programs, I think, are nice. Yeah, uh, you know, for us, uh, one lens I took was, you know, uh, we, as a leader in the CRISPR space, we felt we also have the responsibility to say it's not just rare disease. In early days, the framing was CRISPR, oh, there's 6,000 rare genetic diseases, and that's what CRISPR is going to do. And I said, okay, what is the biggest cause of mortality? Heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. And we said, okay, let's think about, is there a solution there that could be polygenic? It doesn't have to be a single gene. And so we're now doing these trials uh, where we have a single injection against a known cardiovascular risk factor that could reduce your LDL cholesterol for, by 50% for life. Now, again, all these questions emerge that you're asking, should we do it earlier? Because the younger you do it, the better. Because once you already have damaged vessels or you have a lot of plaque forming there, you know, is it hard to reverse those things? So we're going through the same challenges, the same skepticism uh, by a lot of investors saying, you know, this, this, no one's going to do this. You know, why would anyone <laughs> do gene editing uh, for a risk factor? But, but that's how you, you know, change the system in a way. But, so that's our effort. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm a lot older than Sam, so I've, I've lived through this probably three or four times in my career. I, I literally remember the days when monoclonal antibodies were on the outs, and anybody that was doing monoclonal antibodies was stupid, and they were never really going to make it, and the first ones failed. I remember the days when RNA therapies were, people say, ah, oh, that's not really a drug, you'll never make it into a drug. I remember the days in CF where people said, you'll never make a small molecule that can refold a protein. It's just impossible. And, and so a lot of this is just bucking the trends and being confident in the science and taking the science forward. At least in my life, every time we've done that, we've both done good for patients and the company has done very well. You've mentioned age a few times during this conversation. <laughs> Any thoughts on CRISPR for anti-aging? No. <laughs> I, wish, I wish I did. I, I keep asking Sam, is there anything for baldness or anything for age? And he keeps saying no. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you on anti-aging, there, there's all these conferences you know, that are <laughs> happening. And there's two schools of thought. Okay? There's one school of thought that says, do a lot of preventive medicine, like cholesterol reduction, and you take these CRISPR medicines, and you may, you're going to live longer, disease-free. The other school of thought is, what if you just fix neurodegeneration, keep your brain intact, and then it's just a notion of replacing your organs. And so <laughs> the regenerative just medicine replacing approach, your organs. you know, so you create, you know, artificial kidneys, people are doing, you know, edited artificial kidneys. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, you know, but, but the first step in that regenerative medicine approach, which we're both doing is towards diabetes. You know, you can actually find, create cells and engineer them to replace your pancreas. And, and if, if we're able to achieve that, that does send us big signal towards this school of thought. The conferences that are going in this direction are going to make more money than the other one that's preventive <laughs> medicine. Uh, but we'll see. I, I do think that, you know, longevity is going to get impacted by all these medicines, and we are going to live longer. Uh, but the question is, you know, you don't want to just live longer. You want to live healthier for that's, longer. That's the key, right? And yeah. the, the big difference is in sickle cell and CF in diabetes is not only are you going to live longer, the quality of life is dr just dramatically and instantly improved. And that's, you're not treating symptoms. You're not treating for life. You're improving the quality of life right away. Um, audience, I really want you to participate in this conversation, especially because of what my next question is going to be. So after I ask this question, please get ready with your questions. And that is CRISPR for all. I mean, do you both, this is already an inflection point just with this drug approval. I mean, we already, you know, put that, set that flag there right from the beginning. But is every single one of us eventually going to get gene edited? I mean, like, we're all going to get CRISPR at some point in our lives? I hope not. Sam, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, you know, I mean, this is an ethical question for society. You know, CRISPR for enhancement, I'm not sure is the right thing. You know, there's so much unmet need with diseases that we need to fix or people that don't have the have normal functioning whether it's organs or whether it's debil debilitating conditions that prevent them from leading a normal life we have a lot of work ahead of us to do to solve that to bring everybody towards the normal 
and I, I, you know, the only way you think about CRISPR for all is CRISPR for all is some sort of enhancement that people are seeking. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that we should go there yet. I think, you know, or, or I'm sure people will think about it. You can't always control with the new technology like that. But at this point, uh, working on the first phase, which is disease amelioration, followed by a second phase where there's prevention, you know, editing for prevention. Mm -hmm. And then we get to that third phase where we may contemplate these things, but that's still, uh, to me, at least a couple of dec decades away. Yeah. Um, are there questions from the audience? Okay, I see someone in the front here with a raised hand. Can you um, say your name and? Hi, yes, it's working. Hi, I'm Leslie Gordon, um, the parent of a child who had progeria and the um, co-founder of the Progeria Research Foundation. And progeria is a premature aging disease and children die in their teens of heart disease. And it's very tempting to be editable because it's caused by a single base change in 90, the same base in 90% of cases, one base. Um, and so here's my question. Um, you know, we, we think about this all the time. A lot of people talk about, and you mentioned platform manufacturing. My question to you is, what do you really see? What does that really, what is that exactly? What, what does that look like to you? Because everybody sort of says it and dances around it, but I don't, I can't picture it concretely. How is that really going to happen? Great question. Yeah, sure. So, so obviously manufacturing is, is a huge piece of these therapies, and it's a very complicated piece. This is not making pills and putting them in, in packages. It's, it's a lot more complicated for a lot of reasons. So that's sort of the, the bad news side of the story. It takes a long time today, it's expensive, um, and it's very complex. On the other hand, again, going back to my old monoclonal antibody days, I would have said the same thing in 1995 about monoclonal antibodies. And over time, we had a thousand-fold increase in yield and a thousand-fold decrease in cost, and it got much faster. And we're already starting to see that here. So I think in the ex vivo approaches, we will be able to simplify the manufacturing, make it less expensive, less complex, but we'll still, it's still going to be there as an ex vivo sort of thing, and that, that, that's just impossible to overcome in that approach. So that leads to the in vivo technologies that, that Sam is talking about. That's a whole different ballgame. The manufacturing there is in many ways much, much simpler, even though the biology of delivery is much, much more complex. But that's where all of this will be going, and I think there, it will be then amenable to a lot of other diseases. A big part of this, and progeria is an example, is delivery. Delivery is a problem, right? And it depends on which tissues you need to deliver to and how many tissues. You know, we have a very active preclinical program in Duchenne muscular dystrophy in gene editing, and it works beautifully in mice and it works beautifully in dogs, but as you begin to scale it towards humans using AAV, it's just not there yet. And so we just have to solve the delivery problem because the editing problem has been solved. Are there other questions? That was a really good one. No, I'm going to, oh wait, uh, I do see one, right? Should... Yes, great. Hi. Sorry. So thank you for this conversation right. on sickle cell disease. Um, it's really important. My name is Dr. Beverly. I'm a consultant for patient engagement and cultural competence, and I'm also on the board of a sickle cell outreach organization in Westchester, New York. And the fact that these patients are called drug seekers when it's not supported by medical literature is unconscionable. My question concerning um, what you're discussing, what do you see the pros and cons of stem cell transplant versus the use of Vertex um, in patients with sickle cell disease? Because I thought there were some good results from the stem cell transplant, patients who have had it. Well, the, these are a kind of stem cell, bone marrow stem cell. That, that's what Casgevy uh, actually is. It's not an embryonic stem cell, but it's a, it's a bone marrow stem cell that's been engineered and then rehomes to the bone marrow. Um, but there are other approaches, as you say, that are using different kinds of stem cell approaches. You know, for example, in our diabetes programs, we're taking uh, embryonic stem cells, differentiating them into beta cells, and then putting them back into the patients, and we're essentially curing those patients of type 1 diabetes. So it really depends a little bit on each disease and what's best suited for the disease. But the beauty of these bone marrow diseases, these hematologic diseases, is if you can edit or get into the bone marrow stem cell, you can essentially replace the defective cell with a cured or a normal cell. Yeah, if I may add something. Yeah, quickly, because we're out of time. A lot of the stories you see, uh, the patient education, that's why it's so important, are around allogeneic stem cell transplants. There have been cases where, you know, if you're taking an allogeneic stem cell transplant, you're taking someone else's cells 
you know, if they're matched and putting it into the patient's body, right? And if it's not a perfect match, a lot of times you have a rejection or you have other outcomes. And in fact, there's a chance of death. And so those are the stories that come out when, on the allergenic stem cell transplants. With Casgevy, it's the patient's own cells, and that makes a huge difference. It's still a stem cell transplant, but it's an edited stem cell transplant. And I think that's the part we all need to educate patients on because not everybody understands the nuances uh, you know, of, of one versus another and what the puts and takes are.